Welcome back to the Lean Change Management Podcast. I'm sitting here with Ro Gorel and Charlotte Mall, who are Lean Change Agent Facilitators based in Perth, Australia. Uh, I met them both a couple of years ago, and uh, we just finished our monthly facilitator hangout. And uh, welcome, ladies. Hi. Hi. Would you like to tell the audience a little bit about yourselves? So, shall I go first? (laughs) Are you the first? <laughs> There's a bit of a delay. So, um, so I'm originally from the UK. I've been living in Australia for just about four and a half years. I started my career in corporate in an HR role, transitioning people from mainly um, big organisations um, into the organisation where I worked. So that was my first experience of change. And then I moved into business improvement role where we use tools similar, if not the same, to Lean, except we called it Learn. And then from there, managed all sorts of um, interesting projects, including a productivity program. And that was the one that get, got me interested in coaching. So I started to learn how to coach and set up my own business and was working, doing coaching and change consultancy in the UK before coming to Australia. And then, as you say, a couple of years ago, we met you and suddenly um, lean seems to be the flavor of the month. And I'm highly delighted because I loved doing my business improvement role. So for me, it's like manna from heaven. So here I am. Great, great. Welcome. Thank How about you, you Charlotte? Yeah, so again, I'm also from the UK. Um, I've been in Australia a little bit longer than Ro, uh, coming up to 10 years, actually. Can't believe it. Um, and uh, I, I actually, similar starting point to Ro, I actually started my career off in HR too, um, but mainly in the recruitment area. Um, I then actually had a period of time working in not-for-profit, um, working for five years in general business management, really, so small business management. Uh, then went back to the corporate world, and um, had a change to technology and IT. So I actually then became, um, started off in support for IT systems and then multiple roles uh, for global company and uh, lots of experience around change. The organization itself was going through major change um, and really had a handle and um, part of role in, in doing, in helping them um, change themselves. Um, and then, um after that came to australia and worked again in in it to start with but really saw the challenges around particularly technology projects and the people part and just brought my people background to with the technology and um yeah been been working in change for most of the time now i've been in australia um and i'm actually you know just around the same time as, as you jason when you came over to australia excellent great so hopefully the, uh, the viewers and listeners are enjoying the new format. So it's live and unscripted. We start with a topic and uh, we see where it goes. So the interesting comment came out in our, our hangout um, around, do we really need a change method or a change framework? As long as you have your brain and your ears, you're good to go. So I thought an interesting uh, topic would be, You've had uh, you know about eight workshops and and have done some speaking uh, engagements, and you've had agile coaches come to the workshops and change practitioners, people with a wide, diverse background. Um, I've had similar with with my workshops as well. And what do you see when people come to the workshops? Are they expecting to see a framework and a step by step method? And, and what kind of conversations are you guys uh, getting in, in your workshops? <laughs> So I'll, yeah, right. I'll go first. <laughs> yeah. it's, a, it, it's a bit difficult with a delay knowing who's going to, um, to speak when. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, so we've seen a wide range in the workshop. So typically it might be individuals who are um, looking for tools and it might be individuals who are looking for a method that they can then follow. Um, so that's when they start the workshop. And we see some people make the mindset shift by the end of the workshop and they realize that actually the tools are only part of the puzzle. And actually the difference that makes the difference is what they bring to the, the change piece. Um, so the, you know, the, the brain and the two ears, if you're listening to what's actually happening, then you've already got tools in your kit bag that you can use and maybe use in a different way. 
Um, so we, we, we see some people make a sort of behavior shift and some people actually make an identity shift so that by the end of the workshop, they actually see themselves differently. So it's not just that they've learned a whole new bunch of stuff um, and they can see how they can apply it. They've also got huge insights about how they work themselves and how they can do stuff differently. So it's very much the, the sort of um, the, almost in two camps. <laughs> mm -hmm. Charlotte, I don't know, don't know what you would, yeah. you would say. Yeah, definitely. I think, um, you know, we, get, we do get some people who come along who um, just want to know how to integrate change with agile projects, particularly um, because they may be working on an agile project. And so they just they want to have a methodology uh, that they can work in with with the agile um, teams that they're working with. Um, and then you do get the other people who are coming along just to really fully embrace that new way of thinking or you know just being free and I think that's the thing is that they really can be creative and so I think a lot of uh we've seen a lot of shifts as Ro was saying in people who um have actually get their self-confidence feel they've got a voice and actually can have got a lot of skills and depth and and stick um their own personality to offer into that overall process so they may come in thinking, I'm just going to get a cookie cutter type approach, but actually walk away with a lot more than just tools. Um, however, you know, we still get some people who it just really doesn't hit the mark for them. And they really just want to have a, a manual to go away with that they can then go and apply. Yeah, I think the uh, one of the best comments that I got was uh, they, she rated the uh, the course horribly, horribly low and said, uh, yeah, I got more from the people at my group than I did from the expert instructor. And I didn't get my step by step and framework and, and all this type of stuff. And and there's nothing wrong with that. Everybody needs needs different things. But I find that there's there's always an interesting um, bias and perspective that people are bringing in. Um, you know, people who are coming in with an agile coaching background tend to come in with a stance that is more or less anti-framework in the first place, because a mm. lot of, you know, agile is based on four values and 12 principles. So that's their world. They read the four values, the 12 principles, and just instantly get that, no, there's a different way that naturally fits in with my existing beliefs. So when uh, the conversation goes more around frameworks, maybe they get a little defensive or cagey and then the opposite is true when people are coming in from more of a project management or mm. change management background where um i had one person said that you know i would have been lost if i hadn't gone through uh method x training a few years ago so that person needed the structure and needed the steps and needed the the, the boxes to make the link um and uh, I, I think that's where we get stuck in our organizations is looking at our existing biases and then not really having the ability to step outside that because you know people like to say we have to think outside the box when it comes to introducing change but if you're in the organization you're in the box that's kind of the whole idea behind systems thinking is you're in the box you can't think outside of it so you need to get some of that outside perspective mm -hmm. i think it's interesting what you said there jason about um people needing frameworks and this perception that agile doesn't have any frameworks because of course it does because the the, the manifesto and the principles are in themselves a framework mm -hmm. and there is structure there it's maybe not structure in the way that we're used to thinking about it so so i quite like to actually explode that myth in the workshop that they go oh, agile people they just go off there's no discipline there's no willing there's no structure um they just do what they think they should do and i go well hang on a minute you've got sprints you've got scrum <laughs> you've got loads of rituals and ceremonies that go on within agile that structure it's just a different perspective on structure so for me that actually helps those people who need that degree of certainty because it says it's okay it's safe because there is some structure what we're saying is that you don't have to follow a linear process that it's more um it, it evolves and it's based on one of the key fundamentals which is actually understanding what's going on in the system by keeping your antennae up and actually observing and listening so anyway that's 
how I explain it. it doesn't necessarily mean it's the right way it's just a different way of explaining it mm -hmm. yeah I had, I had a conversation with um, one of my classes around uh, it was all people that came from more of a I guess traditional change background so there weren't any um, agile coaches or people who uh, had had been team members on, on an agile team before and we had a conversation around well what's what's stopping you if you're working on uh, some type of IT change or system change something that's not a, a reorg or not transformational by nature what's stopping you from just sitting in the agile team room because we yeah. really don't need to have a big agile change management framework if you're working on something that 7,000 people their jobs are going to change because they have to use this new software tool and you have high impact then why not sit with the team you might only need to participate in the planning and the retrospectives and mm. uh, the stand-ups and things like this in some of the ceremonies, but you're within an earshot of what's going on. So instead of trying to wait until the phases of the project are done and then look at the system and figure out how to document it and create your change communications and all this kind of stuff, what, what's stopping you? This, it's, not, uh, it's not difficult, it's not hard. There's no magic in this agile stuff. It simply reduces the triangulation of, of communication. And um, every, pretty much everybody in the, in the room said, well, the hierarchy is in the way. I'm expected to be at my desk sitting with my department and the managers won't let us. <laughs> and then, right. okay, there's no framework that's going to fix that problem. So now we've, we've got to rely on our brains and our ears. Do you, do you see any kind of similar conversations um, with people that I find a lot of change managers they just get thrown to the wolves and they're like here's a new agile project go do change on it and that's the extent of it they really get no support or no help or no guidance and and they still have all the same restrictions of having to sit in their department area or restrictions in the hierarchy um I don't know, that's tricky actually, because I think we do, again, I think it's a mixture of that potentially happening and that, that depends on the organisation itself. So, you know, some people who have just gone for it and, and just, um, I suppose, you know, we have a culture hack on their part to go in and just say, I'm going to just turn up at one of the meetings or... I think it I think it depends on the style and, and the, the the person themselves and how much they're they're willing to take particular risks. So um, you know, I, I'm thinking about in the past where I've had that where I've come up against the hierarchy and the structure. It's just about working a way around it. And again, that comes down to just using your brain in a bit of a different way. So if you try to follow what the hierarchy and system's telling you to do, you know you're you're really on a hiding to nothing. So you have to work out a different strategy to how you're going to then influence that. And I think that's that's the difference in terms of some people that they feel they're, that they're fearful of doing that for whatever reason. Um, but, you know, if, if, if there are opportunities to just put yourself out there, then that's, that would be, you know, I think they're there. I think, the, I think obviously the whole system piece is just massive and also the, the cultural overlay as well of people feeling able to, to go and step over those boundaries. Hmm. So I don't, I don't know whether it's been quite as strong that we've seen, um, definitely it's, um, in terms of the hierarchy causing you know, restrictions. But I think, I think that, I don't know whether that's shifting, um, Ro, I don't know what you think. I, I certainly think um, there is a flavour of that with some of the people that we've had on the workshops. And I think some of it is certainly down to the organisation type that they're working within. Um, however, I have to, and I would say this, wouldn't I? Um, I actually think it exists in most people's heads. Um, you know, having coached a lot of people, um, what does it always come down to when you're coaching somebody the thing that it always boils down to you know what's stopping you what's getting in the way and you know whether it takes one two three four sessions ultimately they have a realization that it's them that's actually getting in their own way and once they realize that they're getting in their own way they can then come up with solutions in terms of okay what are my options how could I do something different and I think for me what I've noticed is that 
it's that transformational piece, the, the personal transformational piece that where people see that in the workshops that I might be working in this system here that is very restrictive. However, if you know, I'm, I don't have to be that system. And yes, it's going to be hard for me to step out of that system. However, I now have a framework, a set of tools, something that I can actually hang my hat on, that I, I've got a purpose, there's a strategy behind it. And kind of that realization gives them that, that confidence to then say, okay, right, I'm going to try something. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. And it's, it's almost sort of, um, we used to have a, fair, a phrase, you know, something's career limiting. It's almost getting rid of that mindset that something is career limiting and see it as, as you know, empowering. It's personally empowering. That if you can do that in an organization that potentially isn't going to support you, then, wow, you really are a change agent. Yeah, I think part, part of it comes with experience, too. I think mm. if you're, if you're, yeah. if you're new or if you're working in a you know medium or larger organization that uh, your stakeholders or your boss they're so far removed from what's going on at the ground level mm -hmm. they need to see some boxes on a page to show them that oh something is under control I can I can see mm -hmm. the flowchart that we do this that and the other and we know that's not really the way things work mm -hmm. and I think we all know even the sponsors know that too but it's it's better than nothing so. How do you how do you balance when you're you know, either when you're new or you're in an organization that needs a little bit more control and structure? Um, in my workshops, I like to call it the smoke and mirrors effect. So sometimes there's low value, high cost work that you need to do just to satisfy the personality mm. of the organization. Yes. So how do how do people that want and desire that framework? How do they how do they move towards just using their brains and ears? I guess it goes back to that model we were talking about before in terms of, you know, what degree of certainty do people need? And yeah, organizations do need that certainty because they need to know that the risk is covered. They need to know that because um, they're going to have to report to the board, the board is then going to have to report to the shareholders. So that you, you do, it's just a reality that you do have to do some of that. Um, it's how you do it that, that's, that makes a difference. So, and that you, what you do requires you to actually go and understand the organization first to know what degree of, in, you know, inoculation, immunization, drip feeding, whatever it is, Richard, that you were saying, to what degree do you actually have to do that? And in what format do you have to do it? Um, because if they need that, then that's part of the system. So that's part of your insight and that's part of your experiment. So you, you've kind of got, you, you can use the lean change cycle just in the way that you do that. You've got insight, options, experiment. Go, go see what happens. Does that work? Does that give them enough certainty? Yes or no? What else could you do? So it's kind of keeping yeah. that, that cycle mindset going that everything you're doing is actually an experiment. And all you're doing is basing those experiments on the data that you're gathering as you're doing stuff would be kind of the way that I would look at it. Yeah. Yeah, the the language is really really important that there's there it can build a mental bridge for wherever that sponsor or stakeholder is at and where they're trying to get to. One organization mm -hmm. I worked in we we were um, we were using we were rolling out scrum essentially with all of their teams. They had five teams and they were all using Scrum and the language associated with Scrum. So velocity, user stories, story points, all these different types of things. And then um, the CTO had left and the new CTO came in who had a very strong and deep lean background. And we just did a full scale stop on all the things Scrum and started using lean language. So started using cycle time and throughput and work in progress yeah. limits and things like this. Yeah. And the teams were still using the, the Scrum process, if you will. So they were still working in week long sprints and things like this, but we started to move uh, out of the team layer and up into more of the program portfolio layer around you know, throughput with features. And, you know, Little's Law, which is the relationship between work in progress and cycle time, stuff like mm -hmm. that. And mm -hmm. uh, it immediately helped him click because we had been using this, this process for probably, geez, 
a good six to eight months um, <clears throat> before he had started. So the organization had started on their own, and then they brought in uh, they brought in me to do some some additional coaching support. Um, so it didn't change anything that the teams were doing. It was more just how we spoke to that that stakeholder, and that mm-hmm. gave him the feeling of oh, okay, I get what this is. So you know, in my world, I have X Y Z. What is that in this kind of Scrum thing? Mm-hmm. Um, but he was curious as well. So it wasn't just give me the data and I'm not going to go down to the shop floor and see what's going on. It's actually mm-hmm. a benefit because go to the Gemba or go to the shop floor and see what's going on mm-hmm. is something that he personally believes. So it made it a little bit easier yeah. in that sense. Yeah. We didn't have mm-hmm. to get into any of these big frameworks or diagrams or, or, or anything like that. So it worked out pretty well. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I guess that comes into the alignment piece as well, doesn't it? You know, mm-hmm. that's part of your alignment process. How do you un- how do you how do you connect with somebody and meet them where they're at? Yeah. Um, which is the coaching piece again. Um, so yeah, understanding that you're actually talking about the same thing, you just have a different way of accessing it. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, for me, that's the, that's the the beauty of the sort of the the lean change cycle, but if you keep that in the back of your mind, then you can kind of work out most problems just by thinking through that very simple cycle. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And the, the other thing is the four components. So we talk a lot about the four components um, because again, that's got the same simplicity that the lean change cycle has. If you've got those four components, then you can start to, to, to draw a picture. Um, and you can also create that bridge, as you call it, Jason, with how the organization functions and then looking at those four components. Are, are we covering those four components around, you know, the strategic change canvas? Do we have a vision? Do we understand why we have a vision? Do we understand who's impacted by the vision? Mm-hmm. I mean, they're, they're questions that you ask anyway. <laughs> You're looking at creating a vision. So it just creates that little bridge. And, and that simple model that keeps ticking over. Yeah. I find some people, they, they get into questions around um, you know, how, do, how do I not get authorization to use this lean change management stuff, but more how do I sell it? How do I bring it back into my organization where we have our three uh, processes that we use and, and how do I do that? And we get into conversations around, well, it's, it's abstracted enough, just, just like you said, Ro, that you could, you could apply one of these Canvas mm-hmm. processes within your phase X. So it's, um, you know, I'm yes. going to be doing some work with an organization, 7,000 people affected by this change. Um, and it's kind of exactly what we're doing. So they have to go to their board. Um, and they have to figure out how are we going to do all the operational and business readiness stuff. And they came to a workshop and they said, we think this is a better way to do it, but we don't know how to, how to, how to use the language that's going to make sense for them. Because if you go into, we're going to create a big visible room and we're going to visualize the work and we're going to use some, some agile and lean and scrum like elements to run this, that might scare some people away. Mm. So we get into, Mm. and, uh, when you mentioned in the hangout around uh, organizational change, we're coming in to manipulate the system. And it doesn't matter how you look at it, but that's what you're trying to do. Mm. You, you're not trying to, to do anything malicious, but that's what you're mm. being brought in to do. So mm. where do you draw the line between selling it as a process to help you get to where you want to go versus kind of compromising some of your own personal views on, on change? Mm. 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 Uh, I also think that one of the ways you know talking about trying to to introduce questions around how do I introduce it to my organization if you know the language is not going to really work um the way that I've done it with organization very traditional organization is take the tools that they've already got and maybe introduce just one or two and not actually label it lean change or anything like that just actually experiment with it um and just so for example doing a um um a team canvas with with a group a department canvas didn't call it that but actually from a a kickoff perspective just went and used used that tool 
And then actually then said, oh, that they liked it. So we said, well, let's put that into the, the toolkit that you've already got. And so it's just really, again, working within the system to gradually introduce new things. And I think it's that, you know, influencing it by um, introducing something in a, in a very subtle way. Um, and then if people like it and they can see the value, then carry on using it. Um, and I tried one of the other tools and it just didn't work at all. Um, it, you know, by one little bit. So, okay, just don't, again, that was an experiment that didn't work for that at that moment in time um, and move on. Not get too, too precious about um, what what you are using and um, other than, you know, again, having, having your hypothesis in your own head around what you're trying to test and then you kind of measure that and it could be something really simple you know as I said the one that didn't work very well it was for me it was just well if they're going to go and use this tool in these various meetings um, I'll get some feedback and then when I actually asked the question there was no feedback and they said oh we didn't actually bother using it well that was enough for me I, you know walk away move some, move on do something different so I think it's it's that um uh Again, it's that experimental mindset and not getting hung up on just using a tool for tool's sake. It's not going to actually deliver, get you closer to the outcome that you're seeking. Mm. Yeah, I think we we tend to overcomplicate things sometimes. I think we, we, we think it needs to be more complex than it might actually need to be at certain points. So I like to use, um, I've lately I've been using language around thinking of change, doesn't matter if it's transformational or IT change as, as a series of small interventions. Um, and and it, the difference between, you know, some people talk about change events and they say change management is more than just change events. Um, I kind of disagree with that. I think it is, it is those small well-timed interventions where you as a change person, you see the window of opportunity open you know there's going to be a window and you have to know how to look for it and how to dive through it. Mm -hmm. And um, where people get stuck, I had someone in the recent course who said, uh, you know, being a full-time change person is sometimes you have to wait a couple of weeks for the dust to settle. But what are you, what are you going to do in those couple of weeks? You have to be doing something because your, your boss or your sponsor is going to be, well, you know, where's, where's your next set of tasks? What's the plan? What are you doing? And you can't say, well, I'm just waiting for the change to happen. But a lot of the times it is a waiting game. And then we make things worse because, we feel, well, I should be doing something. So I'm going to introduce something else. And um, the, that balance is, is difficult. Do you have any, any uh, before we uh, close off the podcast, do you have any, any advice or tips for people that need more of the tasks and framework stuff, how they could move towards just thinking about change? Uh, using their their brain and their ears type of approach. So that that made me laugh because on um, I, I won't say when um, I've had an experience where um, and I wasn't the change manager. Um, the change manager was being asked to produce X Y Z artifacts, and they kept coming to me, and, and we were talking about why they needed these artifacts. And I said, "Well, you you can't actually produce the artifacts because." <laughs> Nothing has happened yet. Therefore, producing the artifacts would be pointless at, at best and counterproductive at worst. Because, of course, once you produce the artifacts, you then create an expectation. So the, the, the way that um, we, we kind of got around that was, um, I guess, we sort of kept doing that insights piece around, OK, well, this is what we're noticing. This is what we're observing. And just feeding that back into the process to say that, you know, are we ready for this? Are we ready for that? We've noticed this, we've noticed that. So kind of getting them used to the fact that we weren't going to produce the artifact, but what we were doing was giving them information around what we were noticing in the process. Um, because clearly that's the benefit of having somebody who specializes in this field, that they their antennae work in different ways. So it was kind of trying to solve um, their sort of need for an artifact with giving them something without actually producing a document that would then sort of come back to haunt us in the future. So you, you, it's about being wily, I think. You've got, to, you've got to use what's going on in the system to help you. Um, and, you know, that you can't teach in a book, that you have to learn 
by observing what's happening in the organization because they're all different and it's who are the players who who do you see talking to whom you know where are the influence links you kind of have to have that mental map in your head of what's actually going on in the system but you you can't teach that that's that's the kind of thing you can Mm. only experience isn't it Charlotte I mean we've had this conversation so many times yeah yeah and and that and that's it I think it's it's definitely a sensing and a feeling piece of it and and that picture if you if you're somebody who really wants that deep deep detail all the time then that's a real challenge because you're not going to get that in terms of every day of working because it is about that sensing of what's happening and and having conversations and picking up information and being aware of your own bias when you're doing that mm. so there's as you said it's, it's a lot around um sensing big picture rather than just the artifacts and i think to your point where I, you know i'm working on a on a project at the moment where i can feel that there's this building of expectation around some form of artifact that needs to be produced because a steering committee need to see something and and um i said well bring them into the room where we are because then you can see that, that there are things are right. it's not um yeah i can produce something on a powerpoint side but actually coming into the room and seeing where we're at and how we're working as a team that's going to be more beneficial in terms of getting the information that they maybe need to make, help them feel comfortable that things are on track rather than providing a powerpoint or some form of report that is really very flat and doesn't really tell you much come in and let them see what's actually happening on the ground and then then that might help them get that sense of confidence obviously the challenge comes when you do have regulation if you're working in certain industries where they require um, the ticks in boxes but then you just work your way through that what's the minimum viable tick that you need really what is it the minimum minimum viable checklist that you need to satisfy a regulator to think of it from that perspective Mm -hmm. um yeah yeah i'm a huge fan of visualizing the work so it always comes up in the workshops it always comes up with any uh, initial client engagement that if you can't see the work you can't manage it so Mm -hmm. uh, getting past the hump of getting people into these rooms is is always the hard part but you never know until you try so before we uh, wrap up, what uh, what's happening um, with you, Ro and Charlotte? So Ro, do you want to start? And what do you what do you have going on? So over the next two weeks, we've actually got quite a busy period in terms of we're doing a talk in Canberra next um, Tuesday, which is Valentine's Day. So hopefully people will turn up and they won't be going out for a romantic meal. Um, and then we're also next week doing another in-house workshop which we're really looking forward to with a a very interesting client and a very um, exciting group of people in in terms of their their journey. So we're really looking forward to that. And then the following week, we're in Sydney with a public workshop on the Monday and Tuesday, followed by um, another in-house workshop at the end of that week. So by the end of those two weeks, I think we'll be lean changed out. (laughs) (laughs) yeah we'll be we'll be coming back to Perth for a rest I think um yeah very very busy um month um February and um lots of other things lined up for um for March and April and May so we've got some more we've got Perth again um and actually going back to Canberra um mm-hmm. for another workshop um and Brisbane and Adelaide too as well as a number of other in-house um, workshop requests. So yeah, pretty pretty full on uh, first six months of 2017. Um, it's very, very exciting. And it feels like there's been, there's suddenly this momentum mm-hmm. beginning to really build within, um, certainly down here in Australia and New Zealand. Excellent. Well, thanks mm-hmm. very much for joining this morning. Enjoyed the conversation. Uh, it's early for me and late for you. So hopefully uh, the things that we talked about made a lot of sense. And uh, thanks very much. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jane.